couple of weeks ago, I put together this video where I was assembling one of my remote PAVA triggering balls, albeit very fast, as you can see. Um, but it occurred to me that I make a lot of use of these things, actually. They're called jumpers. Now, if you're aware of jumpers, you might think it's a bit dull talking about them, but stick with this video because there's some uses in here that you might not have thought about. For example, these things, these are resistor network boards. And just through jumpers, you can configure this thing from anything from one ohm and in increments of one ohm at a time, right up to 10 mega ohms. So let's have a look at a few more examples that you might find of use. Okay, just a quick closer look at this board. I had this made by PCB Way. I did the design in KiCad, uh, KiCad, whatever you like to call it, and PCB Way made, manufactured them for me. I do all of the assembly of the components. So on there, you can see I've got a number of jumpers and they all do various things. And this is just to demonstrate to you how you can put them to use. There's one here isolates the power to the ESP32. I've got a little connector block there to put in an I squared C LCD display, and I can isolate the power to that. I can isolate the power coming in here. I can isolate, as it's already done actually, these, these LEDs all go through this resistor network or resistor pack. So they share a common ground down to this jumper, and by removing the jumper, you turn off all the LEDs, so you're saving battery power. But if you do want the LEDs to be working, then you just put the jumper on like that. Make sure you get it on both pins, of course. And this one here I like because this is actually three pins, look. So it gives me actually three options. If I put it in the top two positions there, it's connected to top two pins, then this acts as a volt-driven device. If I put it down to the bottom, then it acts as a volt-free device. And all that's doing is routing either the power coming in th from here, if it's in volt-driven mode, through these opto-isolators to my outputs, or it's routing a ground pin through these opto-isolators, just through go kind of joining that leg to the centre or that leg to the centre. And if I put this on one, if I leave the jumper off, or I just leave it on one leg, then it's actually fully isolated. It won't trigger at all, even if it's powered up and you start operating the remote application. Now, if you're putting things together on a PCB like this and you're not putting it into a closure, then jumpers, I think, are a far better option. They're, they are really, really cheap. You try mounting that onto a PCB or, you know, with a standard toggle switch or this type of switch, yeah, they're, they're kind of okay, but they're cumbersome really to use. And you could you could knock this type of thing or, or it's going to get damaged. If it's in an enclosure, absolutely fine. Then you get this type, you know, the rotary where it's selecting whatever output you rotated to. So these are my jumper stock here. I keep two types. There's this type, standard stuff you'd see on lots of components you buy but I prefer by far this type. So that's the ones with the little plastic handle on there so that you can easily put them on and remove them. Now, when you've got lots of jumpers tight, packed tightly together, getting these off by hand is, is almost impossible. You've got to resort to using tweezers. Okay, so let's go and have a look at some wiring examples then. So first up, probably the simplest arrangement is using a jumper to as an isolating jumper. So the power here, as you see, is going through this jumper, although there's no jumper on it at the moment, it's these header pins to the device, so it's currently effectively turned off. And if you put a jumper on there, then of course the device is now powered. It's the same as having a, a power switch. Now that's very basic and probably in that scenario, you would probably be much better off using a switch because you're going to use it a lot more regular than some of the other jumper settings. But in the demo I just gave on that board, this is my LEDs look. So I've got all of these LEDs, they go through that resistor network and here's the common ground. So each of these is going through a 1K resistor to the common ground. So 1K, common ground, 1K, common ground. And by feeding that through a header pin, pair of header pins, then if you remove the jumper, you've killed the power to all those LEDs and it's a battery saving feature basically. Put a jumper on and the LEDs work.
And just to show you, a resistor pack or resistor network sometimes called looks exactly like that. They're very small devices and they're great for that purpose. And next up, this is similar to my volt free and volt driven selection jumper where I had three header pins here like this. And I had two feeds coming in. One was my external supply and the other one was basically just the ground. And depending on where I put the jumper here, this device would behave differently. It could be going the other way, of course. It could be that your device is feeding out either here or here. This might be a left or right channel of an audio circuit, for example. And if I connect the jumper on these top two pins, and obviously feed one is connected through to the device. If I put it on the bottom, then of course feed two goes through to the device. If I put it on one pin, then it's isolated. And just to quickly see, this is how the schematic, this is the keycad extract here. So over here, I've got my external power coming in. That goes to my three pin uh, header pins there. This center pin goes off to trig and you can see trig goes through each of these opto isolators. So whatever this is connected to, when I activate this opto isolator, that's what gets fed to this output. And you can, of course, select it to volt driven or volt free, or if you put it on one pin, then trigs effectively connected to nothing. So you've completely isolated it, it's disabled. Okay. And next up, we're going to look at device address settings. So if you've got uh, an Arduino or something else and you want to give it some device address, maybe you're connecting it over I squared C or something else that you need to give it a unique address, or you can just use this for any other purpose really, but let's just go through it. So this is an Arduino Nano Every. I like the Every because every pin you can configure as an interrupt, but that's not the purpose of this video. Uh, if you look at here, I've just highlighted digital inputs two, three, and four. And if we connect those out to three lots of header pins, three pairs of header pins there, and then the other side, we wire all those to ground. Then what we can do is if there's no if there's no jumpers on there at all, then we can basically consider this to be a zero, a zero, a zero. The digital read of these would all be low. So let's call that that's address zero in decimal. This is the binary here and zero or zero there is the decimal equivalent. If we put one jumper, then it's zero, zero, one or one decimal. If we put the jumper there, it's zero, one, zero or two decimal. Then three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so we've now got eight configurable options. Brilliant, we can use that. It could be an option that you're selecting on your Arduino board, or it could be an address, like I said. And next up, we will look at this one, Boulder Voltage Divider Jumpers, I'm calling it. Now, this one I'm gonna go through in a lot more detail. It's a li little bit more complicated than the others, but nothing to worry about. And it's just to give you uh, some ideas of how you can use jumpers, okay? So this is, again, an Arduino Nano Every. You can use any of the other Arduinos or other microcontrollers. It might be an ESP32. But just take into consideration the operating voltage. So some are at five volts uh, and some are 3.3. And also you need to consider your analog read, how many, what's the resolution of it, how many bits. So on the Arduino every here that I'm using, this is a 10 bit analog input I'm using. Okay, so it's zero to 1023. And if we take the ground pin here and then wire that through a little resistor, series resistors of two Ks, and then wire the other leg into our five volts, then you can see I've got from, well, let's go this way, from five volts, goes through this 2K, then through that 2K, then through that, then through that, and then back to ground. Okay, so we're making a circuit through all of these resistors. Now that, to me, looks like a voltage divider. Look at my previous videos regarding voltage dividers if you're uncertain, but I'm gonna talk through it now. This kind of represents this here, just laid out differently. So five volts, nice bright red to show you that's positively charged. And down here, ground, that represents this pin here, is blue to represent uh, negatively charged. And in between, you've got all the various gradients of color showing you, well, actually, it gets closer and closer to ground as you get nearer to it, okay? So if we took all of these resistors together, because they're in series, then this is 8K of resistance total in that circuit. Well, at five volts with 8K of resistance using Ohm's law, then we know that's 625 microamps. 
So 625 microamps going through that resistor, of course that's going through all of this circuit, they're going 625 microamps through this one, this one, and this one as well. But if we take that, then 625 microamps at 2K, or that, well that's a 1.25 volt drop. And of course you've got the 1.25 volt drop across all of these because each of them are 2K. So you've got 1.25 volt drop across that one, that one, that one, and that one. So we start out at 5 volts because that's where we are connected to. So if we measured at that point, that's what we would get, 5 volts. We're right at the top here connected to the 5 volt supply. If you measure the next resistor leg, you will get a 1.25 volt drop, so you'll get 3.75 volts. You've gone through one of the resistor drops. And then the next one, you would get 2.5 volts. Next one, 1.25. And the next one, you would get zero volts because you are connected to ground anyway. So if we just get rid of all this clutter now, and what we'll do is we'll put some header pin pairs across here so that we can put a jumper on it later on and we will wire all of those into analog inputs too. So if we put a jumper on this one here, we, at, at analog input two, we will get zero volts. And if we did a digital read of analog two, of course we would get zero. And if we put the jumper on this pin instead, we will get 1.25 volts. And based on our 10-bit resolution, zero to 1023, if you divide all that up, then this would return 255. Now it won't be exact and I'll come on to how you work around that in a second. If you put it on the next one you get 2.5 volts and it should return 511. Next one 3.75 it should return something like 767 and at 5 volts it should return 1023. So let's just head over to the bench and check that out on a breadboard see what we actually measure. So on the breadboard then there's my Arduino I know every there. I've not got anything connected to the analog input. It's just a wire floating at the moment. But I have taken the five volt out and connected so to that my five, to my five volt rail here. The Arduino is powered by USB. And here's my little resistor series resistors over here. So it comes in from five volts here through this link through that resistor back here, through that link, through that resistor, and so on. It kind of zigzags backwards and forwards, okay, exactly as I showed. So if I measure now, I've got my ground connected into the board, and we'll measure here with my meter. Then on this leg here, we're getting 4.8, okay, so the 5 volt coming out here is not exactly 5 volts, and there's resistance in the in the breadboard as well so it's not a hundred percent accurate but that's okay the five volts that this is using to calculate its 10 0 to 1023 resolution is actually that voltage so that's the, the first leg there connected to the five volt output the next one i'm getting 3.6 volts the next one i'm getting 2.48, so say 2.5 as we thought. Next one we're getting 1.2 volts. We'll place, yeah, 1.242, so nearly 1.25. And of course the next one is ground anyway, so you're going to get zero. All right, works. So there we go. All of the voltages that we saw were comparable to what we were expecting, but they are not exact. So if we just lay this out differently now, this is the voltages that we were expecting to get across these pins, and we didn't get exactly that, but close enough. And this, if you did an analog read on pin analog two, on these specific voltages, this is what you should get from that analog read. But it's a big gap from zero to two five five. So if we kind of go midway and say, well, anything from there to midway of that is acceptable, and anything from there to midway to that is acceptable, and so on and so on. Then we can base it on that. Zero to one to eight, we'll say, <clears throat> is an acceptable read to assume that it's connected on the first pin over here. And one, two, nine to three, eight, four is an acceptable read for that, and three, eight, five, and so on. Okay, so it gives us a nice window with a load of tolerance in there. So we will apply it like that. If on that pin, if the jumper's selected on there, we expect to get that. If the jumper's on there, we'd expect to get a reading between those and so on. So to write this in Arduino code, there's my function. I've got this read jumper function. It returns an integer. So first of all, it reads the analog input analog two. 
If the value is less than 192, then it must be option one that you've put the jumper on. If it's more than 192 or equal, then the and the value is less than 385, then it will return two. If it's less than 641, it'll return three. Less than that, it'll return four. If it's higher than 896 or equal, then it returns five. So let's see that in operation. Okay, I've got Arduino IDE running here and I've currently selected the serial monitor because my code outputs whatever I've selected to the serial monitor. I've wired in the analog input to connection, but it's not actually connected to anything yet. Okay, and I've done a bit of code to not show you all the erratic behavior of when this is floating, but I'll come on to that in a second. So at the moment on my serial monitor, there's nothing there. If I put it to the first connection, then it gives me an output one there. And if I move it across to the next one, then it tells me I'm on Oh, sorry, option two. And the next one, it tells me I've selected option three. And the next one, it tells me I've selected option four. And then the next one, it tells me I've selected option five. Brilliant. So there's my five options that I can put together with a little jumper like this. Now, you can't really use jumpers on, well, not in this arrangement. You can't really use them on a breadboard. It doesn't work very well. Uh, but what if you're doing it on a PCB or a um, prototyping board, then it works brilliant on there. And it would look something like that. You've got a pair of header, rows of header pins and you move your jumper across to whatever selection you wanted. So there you go, it all works. I returned the value one to five, depending on which, which option I selected on the analog input two. Now when analog input two was not connected, of course, then it's floating, it's, it'll be an erratic reading. And in my code, I've actually detect that by doing sev several reads and if it is erratically changing, I ignore it. But I would expect that if you're using jumpers like that, then you would probably read it when the device is powered up and you wouldn't move the jumper around in its normal operation from that point onwards. So somebody would set the jumper, you would then power it up and use it for a period. And then when you turn it off later on, somebody else using it might move the jumper to select some other option on your whatever your device is doing power it up again and so you're not you're not moving that around whilst it's actively live okay but you can build in like i did and have some kind of code to detect that it's rapidly changing and ignore those instances and just to show you look how cheap these are so here's a i think it's a hundred you get in this set they are three pound 59 from amazon but these are the ones i like i will leave a link in the description below you get a little tub with it uh, four different colors but they've got the little handle on as i showed you so they're easy to remove and put back on and you get 200 in this case in this little tub and they are 9.99 brilliant so hopefully that's given you a few ideas on how you can utilize jumpers in your projects and circuits and if you're mounting on a pcb not in a plastic enclosure or something then i think they are an ideal for those solution for this kind of stuff and if you found this video of use, then please click the like button. And if you haven't done so already, then please click subscribe too. All right, catch you later.